Hello, um, my name is Jeff Farbman from the Wallace Center at Winrock International. I want to welcome you to this National Good Food Network food safety webinar on the United Fresh Gap Harmonization Initiative. We feel this venture has terrific potential and we're happy that uh, we've been able to be a, a part of it. Um, first I want to give you a quick uh, technical orientation for the webinar software. Um, your screen should look like this, the presentation over here on the left and the control panel on the right. Within the control panel is a questions box. If you can't see this, you may have to hit that orange arrow to expand it. Uh, but there is a questions box. Um, you'll be uh, muted during the formal presentation, uh, so please use the questions box to type in your questions for our presenter. Um, and um, we'll, uh, as, as we ask your question, we will uh, unmute you and uh, allow you to, to have a, a dialogue if, if you would like. Um, with our presenter. We are going to archive the uh, presentation. Uh, it will be on ngfn.org slash webinars and it will also be on ngfn.org slash food safety. That's sort of our uh, nexus for all food safety work. Um, and there is a very quick post webinar uh, survey. It will take just a minute to complete and it really helps us to continue to uh, improve our work and our outreach. I'd like to start the webinar with a quick introduction to the National Good Food Network, uh, just what it is. Um, uh, in late 2008, we gathered some thought leaders in sustainable food systems looking to build on the great success that farmers markets and other direct sales that it was having. Um, we are interested in scaling up that good work into the mainstream food system to supply schools, hospitals, restaurants, supermarkets with healthy, fair, affordable, and green food, what we call good food. The Wallace Center, along with uh, a high power team of advisors, created the National Good Food Network to create solutions to scaling up good food. These advisors come from many different backgrounds, including nonprofit, for profit, academia, etc. We created a national network of networks. Uh, we have 10 regional networks, teams of uh, several organizations within a region. This makes up the National Good Food Network. The Wallace Center, as a national coordinator of the networks, what we call regional lead teams, takes the best of the best models and brings them forward to enable replication. We also provide a suite of technical assistance uh, that the regions are able to tap into. This helps us to fulfill three critical goals. We work with the growers and the buyers, connect them, and using this value chain approach, we're able to increase grower viability, particularly small and medium-sized growers. Making these connections and deals adds economic vitality in the rural production areas as well as the inner, uh, urban inner city depressed regions, getting more healthy food where it's needed most. This allows us to reach children and families in their communities. We are a national connector. We make sure the right people talk to each other. Um, we collect and disseminate the best of the best models, knowledge, and technical assistance. We connect regions to funding, both by ensuring they know about national funding opportunities, but also by working to generate new opportunities. We maintain a website and a database of people, organization, and funders to connect people within and across regions. Um, we also use social media to do the same. We help create new models and then document them uh, to uh, share for all to, to replicate. We're a convener, gathering people from different sectors together to share ideas and find common business interests. And we connect with other national networks, such as the National Farm to School Network, the Community Food Security Coalition, and others to coordinate efforts and create synergy, accelerating this work and reducing redundancy. Here are the goals of the National Good Food Network. We want to make sure there is a good su uh, a supply of good food by working with growers and doing on-farm training. We want to act as an information hub using tools such as this webinar, making sure those on the ground are connected to the best information that exists. And we're working sh to make sure that policymakers understand the economic health and social benefits to this work. This map shows that we truly are a national network. We uh, span coast to coast. Here are the members of the National uh, Good Food Network Advisory Council. These truly are the thought leaders in sustainable food systems work. I'm sure many of you will recognize most of these organizations. And in fact, uh, may be part of them. And our 11 regional lead teams, boots on the ground, well-connected, tight groups doing a huge amount of great work. 
You should feel free to contact us at any time. John Fisk is the director of the Wall Center. Marty Grenzer is the manager of the National Good Food Network. Contact at NGFN uh, is the way to email us. So let me hand the mic off to Steve Warshauer, the National Good Food Network safety, food safety coordinator and moderator for this webinar to introduce our presenter for today. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this, I'm Steve Warshauer, and I've been working with the National Good Food Network for a little over the last year, trying to coordinate our conversation on food safety, and particularly looking to find ways to bring information about food safety solutions and food safety issues to our regional leads and to others interested in scaling up to deliver more good food in their local and regional markets. And today, we're lucky to have Dave Gombas from the um, United Fresh Produce Association who has been the real lead person behind a very important initiative that's been going on for closing in on a year now. That initiative is the Gap Harmonization Initiative. First, a little bit about Dave. Uh, David is the Senior Vice President for Food Safety and Technology for United Fresh Produce. In that position, David promotes food safety, microbiology, regulatory, and public policy assistance for the fresh and fresh cut produce industry. He has numerous publications on food safety and recently served as co-editor of the Commodity Specific Food Safety Guidelines for Lettuce and Leafy Greens Supply Chain and the Food Safety Program and Auditing Protocol for the Fresh Tomato Supply Chain. David is currently serving as coordinator for the Gap Harmonization Initiative. David received his bachelor and master's degrees in food science from Rutgers University and Massachusetts Institute of Technology, respectively, and his PhD in food microbiology from University of Massachusetts. Previously, David has held food safety and microbiology positions with National Food Processors Association, Campbell Soup Company, Kraft Foods, and the National Center for Food Safety and Technology, where he worked with US FDA to develop HACCP training courses for FDA investigators. The, um, the GAP Harmonization Initiative has been, been going on, as I said, for almost a year now and was uh, uh, brought about in large part at the initiative of United Fresh Produce and its members. The Wallace Center and National Good Food Network have been participants in the technical working group of the Harmonization Initiative. And any of you who have been on our calls or have been monthly, who, any of you who have been on our monthly food safety calls or who have read our monthly updates, which are posted to the website, have seen regular uh, information on progress with the Harmonization Initiative. And it seems like a great opportunity to have David present to us uh, an overview of the history and progress in the gap harmonization, some of the reasons why it's important, some of the stakeholders and players that are involved. That'll take in the, say, 20-minute, 30-minute range of, the, of this webinar. And then after that, what we're hoping to do is specifically focus, with your help, on the question of how to make this gap standard scalable and workable for farms of all sizes. It's an important goal of the harmonization process that one standard be developed that's suitable for all farms and acceptable to all buyers. And that means it has to be functional and effective over a range of scales. So with that introduction, I'd like to pass the microphone on to David. And we'll look forward to, we, to bringing all of you back into conversation after David's presentation. You can type in questions at any time, as, um, as Jeff told you. But we're going to we're going to pretty much not interrupt the conversation, or I should say, not interrupt David's presentation, but initiate conversation around those questions after the presentation is over. So with that, I give you David Gombas. Thank you, Steve. And I want to thank the Wallace Center and the National Good Food Network for this opportunity to speak with you today. I uh, hope everyone's doing well. Um, what I'd like to do today uh, is let's see if I can get to the first slide. Oops. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Uh, this this uh, program, the initiative, the Produce Gaps Harmonization Initiative, actually goes back farther than a year ago. This actually started back in 2007 when the United Fresh Food Safety and Technology Council, it's a volunteer council of over 90 uh, technical experts in the produce industry, got together and we were talking about what are the big issues facing the fresh produce industry today. And one of the biggest issues had to do with the audit burden, uh, the audit fatigue, the companies saying that they had three, four audits, sometimes in a week, sometimes in a month, but far more audits than they thought worthwhile in uh, coming through the facilities, often asking the same questions, 
often asking different questions, often having the same auditor come through and audit the facility under different, under different names. So at that time, and still today, we have a multitude of different audit companies and audit standards that are out there inspecting field operations, packing houses, and processing operations. All of the icons you see on here are well used within the industry today. The problem with all this is that it, this becomes burdensome for, for growers, for packers, for handlers. With a uh, with multitude of auditors coming through an operation, you, uh, we're hearing that handlers and growers are spending more time showing auditors around than doing their day-to-day -day operations. And so the Food Safety and Technology Council set about trying to figure out how do we overcome this audit burden and come down to some kind of uh, reasonable approach to auditing. Their efforts culminated in a conference in 2009, a global conference on produce food safety standards, where we invited everybody in the industry to come together and talk about the audit burden situation. and What could we do to overcome it? And we had, again, over 200 leaders from each stage of the produce supply chain. We had government there, FDA and USDA both came to the table. We had the third-party standard owners and audit companies came to the table, as well as the suppliers and the customers. And what they found in discussing what's going on in the world today is that in North America, the various produce gap standards that are in use seem to be about 90% or more the same. And if they are the same, then these differences may not be important and it demonstrated a clear opportunity for harmonization. Now harmonization has been tried before. The last time we had harmonization was probably back in 1998 when FDA put out their GAPS guidance, the Green Book, that described what FDA thought were the important, uh, important features in a GAP operation that needed to be controlled. Since that time, because FDA did not control that document, there's been a continual divergence of the expectations at a grower operation or a packing house. And so different groups have tried over time to create a harmonized effort. The California Leafy Greens best practices are just such a harmonization effort, but just for Leafy Greens and just in California. The Food Safety Leadership Council was a, a combination of several retail and food service companies that said if we harmonize our standards, then uh, it'll be easier on the growers and suppliers. Well, that didn't work either. SQF 1000, Global Gap, the Global Food Safety Initiative are international efforts at harmonizing standards for before the farm gates uh, uh, operations. And none of them have really caught on in the US either. So what we tried to do was learn from those experiences and see where we could go that would improve the process. And what we heard from the conference was that there are processes that may succeed. We heard from leaders that said that the commodity-specific standards that have been developed for leafy greens and tomatoes had a process that might work. It was a process of bringing together key stakeholders to uh, come to consensus on what these standards ought to be. And with that process, we were seeing better buy-in from the regulated or the uh, audited community. We heard that harmonization would have to be transparent and open communication amongst all the stakeholders. Nobody could be left out of the discussion. Every time someone's left out of the discussion, they feel that the process does not belong to them and what comes out of that process does not belong to them. We also heard that everybody in the supply chain would need to be involved. The customers like the retailers and the food service companies, the fresh cut processors, as well as the grower shippers and the auditors and the standard owners, government itself would have to be at the table working together on coming to consensus on what these standards ought to be. We also heard that non-food safety standards, like environmental social, social issues, have not come to, there, there was not as much commonality amongst those as amongst the food safety standards. So the conference recommended we stay away from those issues for right now and focus on just food safety standards and address the other issues separately later on. So we decided on a two-step approach for this harmonization initiative. The first was to see if we would get buy-in. If we built it, would they come? And so we put together a small group of very influential produce buyers and produce suppliers in the US today. 
you can read through that list of names. You probably recognize a lot of them. In fact, some of them are probably your customers. And what we asked them was, if we built a harmonized standard, would this be something that they would find valuable? And what would it have to look like? And what we heard at this meeting in September 2009 was a resounding yes. They were feeling as much pain at the buyer level as suppliers are finding at the auditee level. And they were all in, in favor of finding some way of harmonizing the standards and reducing the audit burden. We asked them what would it look like, and they came up with a vision of that harmonization, developing a harmonized food safety standard and checklist for gap audits with a globally acceptable auditing process that would protect consumers from potential hazards that might contaminate produce at that stage of the supply chain and would build efficiencies into the supplier audit process. A very long vision written by a committee. What they were actually saying was fairly simple. One audit by any credible third party acceptable to all buyers. But that came with recommendations. That vision came with recommendations. They said, if you're going to build a single generic checklist for the gap audits, first of all, we want to focus on food safety practices of pre-farm gate produce operations defined by the FDA gap. So stay away from processing operations and other operations that already have regulations and other kinds of audits associated with them. Most of the times, those kind of audits go beyond produce. So they want us to stick strictly to produce operations. The second, they want to clearly define requirements that would minimize the opportunity for misunderstanding, misinterpretation, what we call standards creep, by both operations and auditors. They want to make sure this, what we come up with with a standard is going to be clearly understood, and we don't get into the divergence of interpretations that have led us to where we are today. They want this standard to be globally recognized, but they want it specifically applicable to North America operations. So while this standard would only apply to North America, folks in Europe, South America, other customers of your produce would recognize it as a valid standard. They wanted the requirements to be risk-based, science-based, attainable, auditable, and verifiable, something we all want from any kind of an audit. But they also wanted to consider more than just microbiological hazards. They said you have to look at the chemical and physical hazards that FDA considers reasonably likely to occur in produce operations. They specifically said they wanted it scalable to all size fresh produce operations, large and small, considerate of the regional and commodity specific food safety needs that are out there, but be sufficiently non-prescriptive to be accepting of equivalent food safety practices. If somebody comes up with a better way of protecting the safety of the produce, they wanted to be acceptable. They also uh, recognize that the science isn't conclusive as to how people should be controlling the safety of the produce. So they want this standard to be flexible to adapt as science reveals better practices. And they also recognize that this is only going to be good if we can get a critical mass of customers to accept the standard. So that was going to be necessary. And since the critical mass is already represented on the steering committee, we figured that if these folks bought into it, we were pretty well along the, uh, along the way. They also wanted to make sure that the standard, when it was de finally developed, to be freely accessible by everyone for doing self-audits or audits of, of suppliers or, uh, or by use by third-party audit companies. Anytime we restrict the use of the standard, it would create a, an obstacle that uh, folks who did not want to use a standard would then use to say, oh, well, we need to have another standard, and we'd be back to where we are today. So it had to be freely accessible by everyone. So that was stage one, getting the buy-in from the buyers. The second stage was to get a different group, a technical working group. The buyers might be able to make the decision whether or not to accept the standard, but we needed a different group, a technical group, to decide what that standard should look like. And so we did an open invitation to anyone, any stakeholder who wanted to participate on the technical working group. And we got over 150 stakeholders from the industry to come forward and say, yeah, I want to participate on this. It included customers, suppliers, audit companies, FDA and USDA, and some state governments were all at the table, extension personnel, as well as association staffs, representing a broad scope of the fresh produce commodities, a broad scope of operation sizes, as well as producing, producing regions. It was an open invitation. Anyone who said they wanted to be at the table was invited to be there. No one was excluded. 
The second step we said was we could start from the scratch and build a whole new standard just like everybody's tried to do in the past. We said, why should we do that? There are some very good standards out there that have been written by some very smart people and already have some buy-in from some portion of the produce industry. Let's pick the right wording from each of those and build a standard out of that. So we went to all the standard owners, and there was 20 or 30 that we could find, and we said, can we use your standard as an example of what this harmonized standard should look like? 13 different standards came to the table, including Canada Gap, Senesica out of Mexico, and a lot of others that you can recognize on that screen. Some are commodity specific, some are from large operations, some from small operations. We thought we got a pretty good cross section there of standards that are available in North America today. And what we did was we went through each of those line by line and picked out the words that were common and were best suited to a harmonized standard that would apply to all those different types of operations. We've actually completed a first draft, actually a second draft now, because we completed a first draft and went back and uh, reviewed it again to make sure it would fit for all different kinds of operations. And this is now available on the United Fresh website. I'll show you the linkage later on. And what this standard looks like, if you look at the, the top line of this standard, you'll see requirement, procedure, verification, and corrective action. What this is, the requirement is a simply stated requirement, what's expected to be in place at the facility. The procedure is this requirement rewritten, different words, again, to minimize misunderstanding and misinterpretation. The verification column is instructions to the auditor. That's what the auditor is expected to do to verify that the operation is in compliance with the requirement. And the corrective action is instruction back to the operation again if the auditor determines that the facility is not in uh, compliance with the requirement. So we figure with these four different columns, we can clearly explain what is expected to be in place and how an auditor is to go about verifying that it is, in fact, in place. Going through what the categories are in the standard, it starts off with several general questions, like what management's responsibility is at the operation, what the food safety plan looks like, what kind of documentation, record keeping procedures are expected to be in place, worker education and training, if microbiological sampling and testing is performed, what are the controls around that, does the operation have a traceability and recall program, do they handle corrective actions, and do they do self-audits. Then it gets into specific questions regarding fuel production. What is the fuel history and has the facility performed an assessment about the field history and surrounding lands prior to planting? Does the facility have procedures for worker health and hygiene, toilet and hand washing facilities? Do they have procedures to control agricultural chemicals and pest control uh, products? Water that's used on the fields, both irrigation and for pest control products, and any other time that the water comes in contact with the produce? Are there procedures for animal detection and control? Are there procedures to control soil amendments and the potential contamination coming from them? Are there procedures for the cleaning and sanitation of vehicles, equipment, tools, and utensils to make sure they don't become sources of contamination of the produce? During harvesting, we go on to ask questions about, has a pre-harvest assessment been performed to verify that no new contamination risks have emerged? Water and ice control, containers, bins, and packaging materials, are those protected from becoming sources of contamination? If field packaging is performed, are there controls around that to make sure that the produce coming out of the field is not contaminated? And post-harvest handling, if, they, if the produce is not packed in the field, how is it handled so that it does not become contaminated on the way to the packing house? Likewise, in transportation from field to packing house, are the equipment, the trucks, the bins, the uh, equipment used to transport the produce from the field to the packing house, has it been cleaned and maintained? That's the first of the two standards. The second one is post-harvest operations. I'm not going to go into detail on that one today. But likewise, it's going to have the same kinds of general questions at the post-harvest operations. And then it'll have specific bullet points for produce cooling operations, for packing house operations, 
from transportation from the packing house to wherever the next destination is, and for produce storage. Together, these encompass all of the, the operations that FDA said needed to be uh, controlled in their GAPS document. So some fast facts about the standard. We kept it brief. We kept it as brief as possible, and it got it down to 84 audit items. Hopefully that doesn't sound like a lot because we are started off with well over 400 audit items, but by removing redundancies and by um, becoming more uh, concise in the wording, we got it down to only 84 audit items. It does require more documentation and record keeping than a lot of people have today, but we got it down to only 14 written policies and procedures that, that we thought were critical for an operation to have in place to ensure that they had a functioning and deliberate food safety program. Likewise, records it will include more record keeping than most uh, operations have today. But we got it down to only 14 types of records, most of them supporting the documentation, but including things like training records and records regarding soil amendments and their control and when and how agricultural chemicals were applied and the risk assessments as well. Some of them are optional. Microbiological testing records are only going to be required if microbiological testing is performed. There is no requirement in the standard for microbiological testing. So back to the uh, key question is what's going to make this scalable? Well, as we started off, uh, we were very cognizant that this, if we're going to make this usable by any size operation, we would have to keep that in mind as we went forward. And we worded the document intentionally to work for family operations as well as for the large corporate farms. So the mom and pop operation that is uh, that has not uh, been a major contributor to the uh, uh, to the source of, of produce out in the uh, in the market today should be able to uh, use this audit the same way as any large corporation. We also wanted to make sure that this was not a single commodity specific uh, audit. When we started off, we thought there might have to be a leafy greens audit and a tomato audit. But we found that, the, that although the expectations under each of those crops might be different, the questions were all the same. And so in developing this standard, we were successful in finding a way of asking the same questions. So even a mixed crop operation would be able to use the standard for all the crops all at the same time. We recognize that not all operations are going to be the same. A mushroom operation is going to be very different from a lemon orchard. So some of the questions are going to be not applicable, and this standard allows for that. We also wanted to make sure we weren't going to add a burden to operations by requiring certain kinds of personnel. And so the standard does not require any new personnel be added to uh, an operation staff. What it does instead is it, de it requires an operation to designate who's responsible for each of the different activities that are covered in the audit. And it can be the same person for a multitude of different kinds of responsibilities. So it allows and doesn't require, it does allow for hiring outside personnel, but does not require that, and except for within the limits of the law. For example, if you're in your state or locality, you have to use a licensed pest control operator. This does not exempt you from that. We also found that the requirements the documents and the records as written are generally going to be simpler with fewer employees, the kind of records that would have to be kept. For example, training records would be a lot simpler for a family operation than it will be for a large corporation. Uh, and smaller operations will have an easier time with the risk assessments than larger corporations are going to have. One of the things we also wanted to make sure of was that the auditor was not going to be spending their time reading through records and documents. We wanted the, the auditor out in the field to see what the operations actually look like. So to the extent possible, we instructed the auditor to look at practices rather than written procedures or records, although there's going to be both of that. That's about where we are with the standard, but we want to point out that any audit of any kind of a facility has two pieces to it. You have the standard, which is a checklist, and then you also have the audit process, how the auditor uses that checklist to go around and verify compliance. What we've done so far has been to look at the audit standard. We have not gotten involved in the audit process. 
that is something we're about to undertake. We determined that neither the steering committee nor the technical working group had the skills background to be able to determine how to uh, assign the audit process, how to define what that process would look like. So we created a third committee, an operations committee. And that committee was commissioned to develop the policies and procedure for use of the harmonized standard. And that committee has just gotten started now. We have a lot more questions than we have answers. So this isn't going to happen tomorrow, but it's going to happen fairly soon because the operations committee is just as invested in making sure this is a success as the other two committees. We determined that early on that the standard would have to be freely usable by any audit organization, but it has to be used consistently. So the operations committee is going to figure out how to uh, ensure that it is used consistently regardless of which audit organization is using it. And while every, organ, every audit organization has its own process, one that they think works best for the industry, it's going to be up to the market ultimately to determine which of those audit processes they want to use, as long as they use the same audit standard. So next steps, where do we go from here? The uh, pre-harvest, uh, the uh, field operations and harvesting module, has been completed. That's one I showed you earlier on. We haven't finished the post-harvest operations audit standard, the one for cooling operations and produce storage. That'll be finished at the next technical working group meeting, the last technical working group meeting, which is going to take place up in Issaquah, Washington, being hosted by Costco. And that'll be October 21st and 22nd. And anyone on the call today is invited to uh, participate in that. Once both of the standards are completed, we're going to have to schedule some pilot audits. While the documents look good on paper and sitting in a meeting room, we have to make sure that it's going to work out in the field as well. So right now, we are looking for uh, operations, for auditors, and for customers to come together and we'll trial the standards using uh, different kinds of commodities and different size operations. Uh, we've already got a volunteer to uh, a volunteer mushroom operation that will work with one of the third-party auditors and Costco Corporation as a customer to see if the standard will work in that kind of a situation. Once we go through the pilots, and we're expecting three, four of these pilots, we're going to assess what works, what doesn't, and then make changes to the standards as necessary to make sure that they do work for different kinds of operations commodities. We figure that's going to take several months, so early 2011, we're going to begin developing auditor training tools. That's going to be critical to ensure that all the auditors who are going to be doing this standard, are going to be using the standard, know how to interpret the standard and how to use it. So what does this mean for you? For growers and growers, shippers, and handlers, this is intended to mean that there's going to be a decreased number of audits. We're trying to get to a point where multiple customers are going to be willing to accept the same audit report. So you have one audit done and be able to share that report with multiple customers, which should mean fewer audits. But even if it doesn't, and initially it may not, uh, we do expect that having a single standard for all of the auditors to use and that the customers are willing to accept should uh, improve, uh, well, should improve uh, situations by having consistent expectations that the the auditor should be asking the same questions and expecting the same answers uh, because they're using the same standard, judging compliance the same way. What we're seeing today is a moving target. You can pass an audit one day and with exactly the same operation fail an audit the next day. So what we want to do is eliminate that from the uh, produce industry. So either way, whether we only uh, achieve consistent expectations or whether we hit the home run and are able to get down to a single audit for each facility, either way, it's still going to result in reduced audit costs. And that will allow you to focus your resources on your day-to-day -day operations and food safety practices rather than trying to pass the audit of the day. What can growers and handlers do? We still need input. Uh, despite all those individuals working on the technical working group, we still need additional insight as to whether or not the standard works for the different kinds of operations it's intended to work for. We want folks to review the standard and tell us what's not clear, what opportunities for misunderstanding still exist, what 
what doesn't work for an operation? What have we forgotten? We, had, we encourage folks to use the standard for their own self-audits. Take the audit uh, document offline uh, from where it is on the internet right now and use it for your own self-audit. Does it work? What's missing in there? What's, uh, what is too much? We ask you to go out to your customers. Do they know about the Produce Gaps Harmonization Initiative? Are they involved in it? What do they think about it? Is it something they're going to be willing to accept when it's finished? Overall, we want you to participate. The initiative was created to reduce the auto burden in the produce industry today, particularly amongst growers and handlers. And we want to make sure that uh, the initiative is working and make sure it works for you. All of the information I've just shared with you is currently available on the United Fresh website under uh, unitedfresh.org. And if you go there, you'll see an icon, the, uh, the same icon you've seen on all the other slides. And if you click on that, it'll take you to a separate web page on the Produce Gaps Harmonization Initiative. Everything that has occurred so far is available on that web page. There are summaries of all the technical working group meetings. There are summaries from the steering group, uh, steering uh, committee meetings, and also the operations committee. The draft harmonized standard is available there. And uh, Jason has another um, a link to a blog site where folks can put in comments regarding the standard or anything about the process itself. And we welcome those. All of those, uh, those inputs are, uh, are viewed on a regular basis and considered by the entire technical working group or steering committee, depending on what the question and comment is. So we do welcome those kind of comments at this, this point as well. So with that, uh, a very quick overview of a multi-year uh, initiative. I will stop and Steve, uh, turn it over to you for any questions. Okay, everybody. Well, um, what we'd like to do is just, if you've got questions that you can send us by typing them in on your webinar screen, that would be the best way to go. Um, and then I'll read the question back and identify who presented that question and then we'll also unmute that person so that they can have a chance for direct follow-up. Anybody have any any comments or questions on what you've heard here this afternoon? Well, gosh, if it's going to be all quiet, then I'm going to probably have to ask a few questions myself. And I know how tired Dave is of my questions, because he has to listen to me ask questions every month at the technical working group meetings. But I have a couple of ideas of things that may be on people's minds. Um, particularly, uh, what I noticed, David and, David, and I'd like to hear you um, give us some thoughts on this, the idea of equivalence. And um, you, you commented in your presentation that, that the, uh, the smaller producers will have a whole different sort of scope of work in conducting a risk assessment. And then, so the two ideas of risk assessment and also developing equivalent methods of attaining food safety standards. Do you have any thoughts on how that might help our smaller producers and the community organizers who work with those producers to see this, um, uh, the GAP standard as being relevant to, their, to them at their scale? Sure thing, Steve. Uh, let's talk about the risk assessment first, because that seems to be a, uh, a question that keeps popping up. The risk assessment isn't intended to be particularly lengthy or burdensome. It's certainly not going to require a scientist to do. What that's going to be looking at is taking the audit standard is really what it's going to be doing, and walking around the operation prior to the first planting and seeing if there are any risk factors out and about that might have an impact on the safety of the produce. So looking across the fence at the neighbor, do they have any animals out there that may be sources of contamination? Are there any piles of uh, manure or compost out there that may blow over onto the field? Uh, has anybody put a landfill in next door that wasn't there the year before? So these are the kind of simple questions that uh, just looking across the field uh, may be, uh, would be part of that risk assessment. How do you plan to uh, apply compost this year? What is your source of agricultural water? Has that changed from the year before? Uh, workers, are you going to have the same workers as the year before? What kind of training do they have? All of this is part of the, the uh, risk assessment pre-planting. And so for a small family operation, we have very little turnover. A lot of these questions are, are going to be very simple. Much of it's going to be well, the same as last year. 
but it's intended to be an intentional look at the risk factors that are identified in the standard and see if there's anything that has popped up since the last time the standard was, uh, last time the uh, risk assessment was done that might cause an operation to have a problem during the course of the year. Better to address it early on prior to planting than later on. And it's going to ask you to do it again later on, just before harvest, before first harvest, uh, just to make sure nothing else has happened in the meantime. Again, an intentional look at what those risk factors are. For small operations, that's always going to be easier than it is for large operations that have a lot more acreage, a lot more personnel, a lot more equipment that have to be accounted for. And then Steve, you were asking about uh, equivalent practices. Um, yeah. Actually, we don't. Uh, I, none came to mind while we were writing the standard, but we wanted to leave the opportunity. If somebody came up with a clever approach that would control a hazard and it wasn't covered in the standard itself, we did not want somebody to have to follow the standard rigorously um, and, uh, and ignore a clever idea. So that opportunity is in there, and auditors are going to be instructed to look for it and allow for it. OK, well, here I, I have a, a question come through from Jim Hollier, who says he's not available on the phone. So I'm going to just read this to you. Um, Jim says, aloha, Dave. I'm not on the phone. Can you please tell me if the organic industry has been involved in this new development? Also, in Hawaii, we work with commercial farms as small as 300 square feet. So I am looking forward to piloting your draft. Will there be points or failures added to the draft so we can really pilot it similar to how we are currently using the Primus audit? And that's from Jim Hollier. Uh, very good. And, uh, uh, Jim, good hearing from you, so, although it sounds like you're not on the phone. Um, let's see, organic. Let's take a look at organic first. USDA has been a partner in this right from the beginning. So we have asked them to make sure that this is going to be as applicable for organic operations as it is for conventional farming operations. And what we've heard is, yes, it is. There's nothing in here that a, a, an organic operation should find difficult to comply with versus a conventional operation. So uh, there's no restrictions in here that would preclude an organic operation. And again, we, tr we intentionally tried to make sure this was going to be applicable to all different kinds of operations. Now, piloting it. Uh, we're not at a stage yet where it's going to be useful as an audit checklist, only because we haven't figured out what's going to be the weighting or the scoring on the different items in the audit. We tried initially uh, with a different program to simply assign this is a major must, or this is a critical, or this is a recommendation, or this is a this is worth 10 points, and that one's only worth one point. And we failed. We failed to do that because every customer had a different expectation of what was important. So we're still trying to figure out a way to be able to rank these items and uh, and create some kind of an overall. Uh, rating system for different types of operations. If anyone has any clever ideas, I'm open for them. I can tell you that the tomato industry in California took this type of an audit and decided everything in here is critical. Everything's critical because that's what we try to do is to call out all those other items that were, were that were nice to have but not really important for food safety. And everything that's left is important for food safety. So in that case, everything has to be complied with. And so the way the tomato industry in California is handling it, everything has to be complied with. There are no exceptions. So that's where we are today. And I'm still looking for a clever idea on how to uh, rank these, uh, these audit items. So some of that development of ranking process will come out of the, may come out of the operations committee work, do you think? Or will it come more out of the pilot projects? yet to be determined. I would guess that the pilot pro, uh, project may reveal some of those clever ideas. Um, we'll see. Yeah. OK, and um, one thing to remember when, this, when we're talking about this 
particular gap audit. This is not the FDA or potentially regulatory driven audit. This is an audit program that's developed to meet the requirements of buyers. And so um, as, we look, as we look at what the buyers will require of producers coming forward to bring their food into the supply chain, the, uh, when we think about a harmonized standard, again, the idea is that if we, don't, we want all farmers to be able to gain access to the market that they desire by being able to answer to their buyer's request for food safety verification. So the GAP standard, you know, part of the reason for its attempt at sort of uh, its goal of achieving a universality uh, is that we really don't know without uh, buyer involvement, we don't know enough about what each buyer is going to require and that differing requirements from different buyers is what leads to the audit fatigue. That audit fatigue concept is something that I don't think small producers have experience yet. Most of us would consider one audit to be a source of great fatigue. So in the end, what we're looking to do is, is we bring the smaller producer community into the audit process to bring them in in a manner that allows them to, to so to speak, crawl before we walk and walk before we run, and as we progress, be able to add, access larger market opportunity or greater market opportunity because we're able to bring forward a verification of our practices and thus we don't have buyers saying, no, you know, you don't meet our standards, so we can't buy from you. Well, I'm, I'm looking if anyone else on the call has any more questions. You know, we had one here from Jim, and uh, anyone else who has any questions, go ahead and type them in to me. And then in the meanwhile, I guess we'll just keep talking about other aspects of the process as we continue to go forward. Um, you know, Dave mentioned the uh, opportunity for people to read the standard um, and also to comment on it through the United Fresh site and through the blog, which is linked to from the United Fresh site. And we think that's an important, uh, with an important opportunity for input, but also recognize that it is challenging to get really deeply into the technical details of a GAP standard. So one of the other things we're looking for is, is uh, suggestions on how to get direct feedback from producers. And again, that's particularly difficult with small producers for example, you know, we hope to have more producers join us on the call today, but I think it's largely um, uh, community organizers and individuals involved in representing um, uh, small producers and helping provide services to small producers. So ideas that any of you may have on how we can get producers to directly consider the potential and challenges of this audit approach, we'd love to hear those suggestions as well. Now we do have a question from our on our, one of our favorite topics, which is not about gap harmonization, but it is about the regulatory, um, uh, uh, the potential regulatory gap requirements. Um, uh, Jim Hollier is asking Dave if you have any updates or recent comments on um, Senate Bill 510. And I know that's not your specific area, but if you could just pass along to all of our listeners what you've heard, because at this point it's basically day to day on whether um, Senate Bill 510 will make it onto. Uh, uh, onto the Senate floor. And then Jim also asks, what about PTI? What is the deadline on that? Yeah, thanks, Jim, again for the uh, good questions. Um, Senate Bill 510, you're all aware, is the food safety bill coming out of the Senate, and it's intended to partner with the House bill that was passed last year. And, uh, and between the two of them come up with new legislation that would direct FDA how to verify the safety of the food in the U.S. today. And it's a relatively good bill, but unfortunately we have a few folks who, in the Senate who have put up uh, obstacles to its overall acceptability to the, to the Senate. So right now, you know as much as I do, um, Carrie Rita in Nevada said that it's, uh, this is a dead issue until after the elections. And if it is a dead issue until after the elections, it's it's questionable as to whether it would ever come to the Senate floor this year. And if it doesn't come to the Senate floor this year, they'll have to start the process all over again with the new Congress in 2011. So there are initiatives going on right now to try to convince the Senate to bring it to the floor prior to them going out on, uh, on their, uh, going back to, to, um, to their states and uh, get it passed now while they still can. It's not, they, the Senate has not gone, has not forgotten about it. There are a lot of staffers running around this city right now trying to find out, is this bill salvageable? Can we overcome the objections of the 
uh, three senators particularly that have objections to what's in there right now. And that, I'm referring specifically to the Feinstein Amendment on BPA, the Tester Amendment on small <laughs> operations, and on the uh, Coburn objections to the cost of the bill. All valid concerns, and right now they're trying to figure out if there is an answer to that. If they do come up with an answer, in very short order, because really we only have this week before uh, the uh, the Senate breaks for for their next um, they break to go back to their states, um, and if they can't get it done, then it is questionable as to whether or not they let it done this year at all. That's Senate Bill 510. But even if it does not pass, what we've heard from FDA is they are moving forward with a produce bill. Uh, a produce regulation. There will be a gap regulation uh, in 2011, regardless of what the Senate does with this bill uh, this week. So FDA does not need any new uh, um, procedures or uh, authorizations to be able to go forward and write that kind of a, a regulation. They've known they've got the, the right to do that all along. Um, they were looking for instruction. From Congress on what that that produce rule should look like. So if they don't get that, they will work from what uh, the instructions seem to be, what the intent seemed to be, and put out a pro a proposed produce rule in any case for next year. So pre uh, be prepared to see a produce rule that looks at having a written food safety plan that has a. Uh, that requires an assessment of hazard, that risk assessment I was referring to before, monitoring of the controls for those uh, those risks, um, includes traceability, includes recall programs, includes corrective actions. We were very careful to make sure we had FDA informed all along the way when we were working on the harmonized standard to make sure that what we were writing was going to be consistent with FDA's thinking on what that produce rule would probably look like. So uh, even though we're talking about S SB 510, and uh, that's separate from the harmonized standard, it is still linked. And so yes, if, the, if we go forward as expected, and as FDA goes forward as expected, what you're going to see is a proposed rule will be very consistent with the harmonized standard. PTI, PTI is continuing on as well. That's a produce traceability initiative. And again, we want to make sure that everything at the produce traceability initiative is going to be consistent with a harmonized standard and with the uh, FDA's produce rule and any other rules that refer to traceability. And at this point, as far as we can tell, they are. Um, I've got a small technical problem on my end. My internet connection has disappeared, but I had one question come up before my connection went away, which is from Catherine Strickland, who's asking whether, Dave, David, you would be um, willing to let folks receive a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, um, or perhaps we could post it as a downloadable presentation on our NGFN website. Um, this would be a useful way for people to show the material to others who weren't able to be on the webinar with us today. What do you think of that request? Absolutely. Uh, anything we can do to uh, further um, the information about the initiative, what it's intended to do, or help you folks to to uh, get the message out, I'm all for. OK, and um, Jeff, since I, I'm not getting updates to my screen as sure. additional questions will be coming in, can you jump in and, and rescue here and if we got any more questions after Catherine? Uh, yeah. Um, we have a question on the uh, the content of the one, one particular piece of uh, the standard itself, um, <coughs> how uh, it, how natural fertilizers such as manure are, uh, if they're part of the standard, are, are they allowed? Um, there's some reference to the uh, California Leafy Green Marketing Agreement that didn't allow or had restricted access to manure. So, it Yep, very good question. And because the standard was written for all different kinds of commodities, um, manure, untreated manure, um, it was certainly determined to be a risk for leafy greens. Uh, that's what the leafy greens marketing agreement said, or the uh, the best practices there. But for other kinds of commodities, you know, tree crops, for example, it may not be as much of a risk. So what the and I'm right now reaching for the 
the line items in the standard that refer to soil amendments, because that's where we're talking about it. I just want to make sure I don't say anything inappropriate. Soil amendments over so here. That the food safety plan shall address soil amendment risk, preparation, use, and storage. And it says, if animal-based soil amendments or biosolids are used, records of the composition, dates of treatment, methods utilized, application must be documented. And evidence of processing adequate to eliminate pathogens of human concern uh, uh, shall be documented. So if uh, an operation wants to use raw manure, what it would be re required to do is demonstrate that the application of that manure has been applied, uh, that the application does not create a risk to contamination of the produce. And so that would be uh, up to the individual farms or the commodities or representatives of that growing practice, for example, the organic uh, association, to demonstrate that the kind of application that is being used on that farm does not pose a risk to produce contamination. And that's at the end of the day, that's what everyone's really looking for. So rather than restrict any kind of use, um, there has to be a documentation of the comp composition and the time and method of the application or whatever else, other kinds of controls were used to assure that it was being used safely. I want to, I want to tag on to your answer, David, if that's OK. With, um, with manure application or any type of biosolid, either there has to be some kind of a documentation that it is a, that it was produced, and as in the case of compost, produced according to a safe practice or there has to be a time period between the application and um, the eventual harvest of the food crop. So this is a really this is a good example of, of risk assessment in action. Uh, there's not there is there's no blanket statement or blanket requirement about how composts are created or used or about how man raw manures are used. What there is is a, is a requirement that the food safety plan document the method of application and identify how risks are minimized. So it could be that, a, for example, a fall application of raw manure is suitable for, for all crops as long as it's 120 days until anything is harvested, with, depending upon tillage practices or irrigation practices and so on. So the idea here is that it, it, by being non-prescriptive, the standard really invites a holistic approach where, um, as in the case of a, of a crop rotation or an organic program, um, there, are, there are, are goals being achieved through the timing and um, uh, application of that soil amendment, which in turn can be demonstrated to result in a safe product at time of harvest. Okay. I'm not sure if that's helpful, but I, want, I wanted to try, kind of try and boil it down a little bit more to what would one of us come up against in the field if we wanted to continue the practice of applying raw manures, and it would probably mostly be answered through timing and through crop rotation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, would have to address, it would have to be addressed in our uh, food safety plan. Okay. I'm it still offline, Seth and Jeff, so I've got to rely on you to keep bringing in. <laughs> okay. Um, there is uh, a question about, uh, Jim has a question about uh, the blending of food safety issues on farms and the push for farm to school. Um, the, he says it seems like a potential issue given that uh, there are a lot of new farmers who are getting into the game and might not have the common sense that other farmers have. Um, so just, I don't, I don't know if you want to quickly address that. Well, that's a, that's a very good question. We do like the idea of the the, um, uh, the Know Your Farmer initiative that USDA is pushing out. We do like the, the locally grown initiative out there, making sure that we can, um, that the small operations have as much uh, access to the market as the larger operations do, you know, recognizing that in many cases we're dealing with weather as the limiting factor, not necessarily the size of the operation or the location of the operation. It's, um, but we also know that this is going to attract a number of operations that have not been involved in what we'll call large-scale uh, commercial production and have not been as uh, aware or have not had to meet the same requirements as some of the larger operations have over time. And what we're expecting to see as this progresses 
that the receivers of that produce are going to start expecting the same level of compliance with food safety expectations as the, the larger operations. We're already hearing this from the buyers. They, they like the, the buy local of type of operation. And we're also hearing from USDA who's saying that, yes, we do want to get some more of the local produce into our schools and a lot more produce into our schools. But we do expect that food safety programs are going to be in place and administered, monitored to the same degree. Uh, what we've, we know as scientists is that the pathogens, the risks, don't know what size operation they're on. And so it's just as likely to be an issue on a small operation or local operation or as it is on a larger operation in, in some other country. So we need to make sure that those those operations have effective food safety plans in place. And what we're hearing from customers and from the government is that it's going to be the expectation in the future. Okay. Well, quick, uh, not, I'll, again, I'll try to see if I can synopsize what David's comment was, that um, farm to school represents another buyer. When the buyers from the farm to school programs require food safety verification, they will be making those requirements based on a set of GAP standards, and hopefully they will use this universal GAP standard. Uh, and in fact, I think there's another layer where perhaps in the private sector, buyers have a greater discretion as to whether to require verification of food safety standards and food safety capacity or not in the farm to school, because often federal money is involved in the program it may not be an option for the buyers to accept non-GAP certified product. And we may be in a gray area at this time where buyers are not yet being audited to verify their practices. But at a certain point, if the FDA and USDA are working together on this, we can expect a requirement from farm to school buyers that food safety practices be verified through some kind of audit process. Um, again, Jeff, I'm, I'm still on Yeah, line. fine line. Well, I, um, I, I want to sort of open up uh, the, the possibility that if you think of another question, um, you can email us. Uh, contact at ngfn.org is a good way. Uh, and we'll, we'll direct the, the question to Dave or to Steve as appropriate. Um, but it looks like our, our queue of questions is empty except for one. Uh, Quick question on uh, the restricting of uh, human waste. Uh, if if there's a, is there a restriction on using human waste in uh, commercial agriculture? And uh, if there is, what uh, what agency restricts that? Oh, another good question. I think that I'm not sure which of the three agencies. It, I would like to say EPA, but it could be USDA or FDA has procedures in place on how human waste has to be treated for application in agricultural settings. So they call those biosolids. And I'm not aware what the, I just don't remember what the, the citation for that is. So sorry about that. But there is a, I think if you actually go to the Code of Federal Regulations and Google biosolids, it will probably pop up. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, Dave, I'd, I'd like to thank you so much. This is a wonderful presentation. Uh, clearly, you and United Fresh are committed to scale appropriate standard, and uh, especially for those at a smaller scale, uh, very welcome. Um, uh, I want to let you, our uh, attendees, know that the NGFN does have regular webinars every third Thursday of each month, uh, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The topics are wide-ranging, but focus on presenting the state-of-the-art in scaling up good food from multiple, multiple perspectives, distributors, retail, other national networks, etc. <clears throat> All of our previous webinars are archived, and they are accessible on the web. NGFN.org slash webinars is the place to go for that. Um, our, our next webinar is a bonus webinar. It's uh, next week. We just had to squeeze this one in. We, we couldn't wait till the third Thursday of October. Uh, anyone with an interest in food hubs or aggregation or creating strong regional food systems should come to this webinar. Jim Slama from FamilyFarm.org and Kathy Nyquist from New Venture Advisors will be giving a workshop style webinar on how to do a local food assessment with a focus towards feasibility of creating food hubs. We just couldn't be more excited about this. 
this should be wonderful. Uh, and the third Thursday of October, the 21st, Real Food Challenge will introduce themselves to you. This organization has had enormous success in their unique strategy, merging food systems work with student leadership. They are training college students full of energy on how to work on their university cafeterias to buy more local and sustainable food. They're so innovative, we had to share this program. In addition to an overview, <coughs> overview of the program, excuse me, you'll hear from at least one student on the progress they have made at their school and a food service distributor to tell uh, their perspective. To sorry, food service director. To register for each of these webinars, you can go to ngfn.org/webinars. We also, as I mentioned, have this growing archive of uh, the recordings and slides, written QA, other resources. Um, this uh, this webinar will be up in a few business days. We'll also cross this, post this on the food safety section of the site. Um, many of you know that the NGFN publishes a monthly e-newsletter where we collect some of the more notable stories in the scaled up good food world. If you'd like to contribute a story idea or even a story, let us know. Email us, contact at ngfn.org. Uh, and you can this month and all previous months uh, see them uh, at ngfn.org slash network news. Um, this crowd will be interested in the food safety section, ngfn.org slash food safety. You'll find uh, our work to do with food safety. Steve's monthly food safety updates are posted there and older ones are archived. We have a food safety FAQ for those just getting involved in the food safety world and there's an interesting primer on the Global Gaps group, uh, group or option two certification. Uh, there are other things there too, uh, ngfn.org slash food safety. And the NGFN is a convener, and as a, such, I want to alert, alert you to two upcoming events. The next Community Food Security Coalition Conference is in New Orleans, October 16th to 19th. The 14th annual uh, conference, uh, a full plate of tours, workshops, pre-conference sessions, and more. The organization that has led national organizing around food, culture, and justice invites you to come and experience the gumbo that unites us all. You can go to Community Food conference.org. And the It Takes a Region Northeast Regional Food uh, food System convening is in Albany, New York. Uh, that's November 12 and 13. Um, NISOG, the Northeast Sustainable Agricultural Working Group, uh, convenes a meeting of practitioners and advocates in the Northeast to explore the concept and reality of regional food systems, what they are, why, and how to build them. Uh, the event includes pre-conference trainings on November 11th. NISOG is a regional lead team of the National Good Food Network, convening the full spe spectrum of food buyers, producers, distributors, community leaders, and more. Uh, it takes a region.org is the place for that. And you can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. I'd like to encourage you to add your name, interest, your bio, and other information to our growing database of people, organization, and funders, increasing your ability to connect people within your regions and nationally. This is a resource for people in your region and across regions doing similar or complementary work to, to find you and for you to find them. It's all part of the NGFN acting as a convener. Look for the database link in the resources section of our site or ngfn.org slash database. Uh, and if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage and also ngfn.org slash food safety. Um, please contact us at any time. Again, that email address is contact at ngfn.org. The NGFN would like to thank you for your time today. Um, once again, let me encourage you to uh, feel free to send your questions uh, post facto over to us. And let me encourage you to uh, fill out the survey that will open in your web browser in just a moment. Um, this concludes the webinar. Thank you very much.